car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with host David Lamb and the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you for joining us tonight for the next half hour. We have uh, an expert here that's going to talk us through a topic of conversation and a subject matter uh, that we believe is of interest and will be of interest to you. We're going to get to that and make those introductions here in just a moment. But first, kind of some ground rules of how this works in case this is your first time with us. You'll notice at the bottom of the screen all throughout the program, there are ways you can call, text, email, get in touch with us. We'd love to have you do so. The show is always better when Whenever you are chiming in, you are participating, and uh, you are letting us know what's on your mind and the questions you have that we might could uh, answer tonight. So we'd love to hear from you. Also, Hollis Wright makes available all throughout the program tonight attorneys standing by live to speak with you. That's a free off-air and confidential conversation. So if you've got a question right now or you get one in a few minutes, give them a call or you can text them, text that question. And again, those attorneys are standing by all throughout the program tonight. Now leading our conversation, Drew McNutt, an attorney with the firm Hollis Wright. Good to see you, sir. Are you well? I am. I'm good. How you are and, you? You and the family are safe and good and... Everybody's good. No okay. no real scares yet or anything all like right. that. But yeah, we're trying to make, make it through it. Now, um, you are a young father. Now, how old are your kid kiddos? Five and about to be two. Five and two. So yeah. Yeah. So well, you're you're sleep. You're getting great yeah. sleep and just uh, sleeps. The sleeps fine. It's the it's the awake hours when we're locked up in a house and can't really <laughs> don't have a whole lot to do on the weekends. You, you got to get creative. Figure, figuring out you? what we're doing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You got to get creative. So so how long you you look like a young fella? All right. So um, how long you been practicing law? How long have you been at Hollis Wright? Give us the, the, the short bio on you. So I've been practicing since 2010, so okay. about 10 years. I've been at Hollis Wright for coming up on, I think, six years. Yeah. I okay. think that's right. Well, yeah, it's been a while. Well, congrats. Thank you. I remember when you came on board. Yeah, uh, I think it was August of six years ago, so okay. coming up on six years. Well, good. And so you've been with <laughs> us a few times, so this being on the attorneys is old hat now, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> try to. <laughs> All right. So our uh, what we're talking about tonight is um, uh, drunk driving. You guys in the profession call it... So it comes down there when you talk about injuries resulting from drunk driving, you have two claims. You have a claim against the drunk driver. Okay. And then there's a whole separate area of the law that we, that we categorize as dram shop litigation. Okay. And it's basically those claims against the individuals and entities that resulted in the drunk driver becoming intoxicated. Okay. And those are primarily against uh, convenience stores, restaurants, bars that over-serve individuals resulting in high levels of intoxication that result in the accidents that injure and kill people. Okay, so that's the subject matter tonight. A reminder, if you want to uh, speak with attorneys standing by or join our conversation, the ways to do so, 844-LAW-TALK. That's the number to know you can get the firm anytime, 844-LAW-TALK. Uh, or locally in the Birmingham area, that number is 205-324-3600. 205-324-3600. So from a jumping, um, kind of a starting point here, a jumping off point, talk to us about how, um, when, it, when it comes to these matters, is, is, there, um, is there pretty specific legislation in terms of, of, of what happens if, if, you're, if someone is caught driving and they are intoxicated, Pretty specific process and and some and some laws, kind of some legal groundwork. Yeah, they're unique claims. I mean, obviously, against the drunk driver, you would have your traditional common law claims, negligence, wantonness, reckless conduct that we all hear about. But when it comes to the dram shop litigation, some there's some historical context that leads up to how we got here. Okay. Um, traditionally, there was no claim to be made against the individual or entity that serves you alcohol. Okay. And so there was no common law claim that so had. So by that, do you mean me as the consumer of alcohol and the the bar or wherever I get the alcohol? No, the the consumer of alcohol that caused the injury. There's always been a claim that you can make under common law. But okay. In terms of the bartender or the bar that served right. you, you could not. The injured person couldn't come back and say, "Well, they got this guy drunk, yeah. and so they need to be held responsible." So. Okay. Sometime around the turn of the century, the Alabama legislature enacted two laws that provide statutory remedies or claims that you can now go after the bar, restaurant, 
um, or individual that overserved the person that ultimately caused the accident. See, that's kind of crazy to me because I, I see in the notes. So around 1907, mm -hmm. 1909, yep. it was an issue that long ago. <laughs> yep. And the reason we call it dram shop is because dram is a uh, is an old unit of measure that bartenders used to serve, basically like a shot glass. Really. And so that's why it's called dram shop. Is it's a shop that would serve drams of alcohol. How about that, Drew? Yeah, it's um, and so it's everybody's like, why does it called dram shop? Yeah. It has some historical context that ultimately led to those laws yeah. and that we still use today to to prosecute claims against uh, restaurants and bars that overserve people. Uh, um, there, there seems to um, have really been this public effort, uh, you know, about there's so much now about not drinking and driving that that is like when I was a kid watching TV. There weren't that many of those ads. There wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, or billboards or all of that. Now there really seems to be such an emphasis. You see billboards all the time. Um, the Alabama, you know, the 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 whenever you're on the interstate, you know, yeah. there'll be messages there. So much um, advertising is done. In terms of, is is this still a big problem? And by that, I'm asking specifically for you all in the firm. Is this is this? Do you get a bunch, uh, quite a few cases? And, and issues having to do with this. We do, and, and the reason it's always going to be such a prevalent issue is because the, the statistical data of the injuries and deaths that occur from drunk driving are, the, the chances of death are astronomical compared to just your regular old car accidents. Right. It's because the, the accidents usually involve high rates of speed, crazy conduct, running red lights, blowing through stop signs. And so it's, a, it's an issue because it, it truly, if you're involved in one of these accidents, it, change, it can change your life. And it can change your family's life. And that's why I think it's become a much more prevalent issue in terms of discouraging the conduct. Mm. So I, I kind of wonder if that is even working. You know, if, if, if there are kind of nationally or globally fewer cases due to all of those ads and all the stuff that you see, I would hope it's having some impact, but I'm, I'm just curious. I don't know if I have an answer on that. Yeah. I mean, I think as long as there are, are, as long as you're drinking alcohol, it impairs judgment. And so people make bad decisions in terms of getting behind the wheel. Right. And I, I don't know that it, if it discourages it, I think it makes it, I think pe people are more aware of it. And with ride sharing apps and, and cabs and everything, I think it's easier for people to go out. And if they do have too much to, to be able to get home um, than it used to be. But at the same time, I don't, I don't think the statistics are showing that we're slowing yeah. down in, in the number of accidents we're having. We're, we're about drivers. to have to head to break, but one of the things the coronavirus kind of has proven, though, is there is still that prevalent attitude, well, it's not going to happen to me. Yeah. You know, like, well, um, you know, you hear that so much, um, but also even with this, you know, well, um, folks, and especially if, probably if you are somewhat inebriated, your decision making is not going to be you know, on point. So, so no one thinks that's going to happen to them and they yeah. can get away with it and they can drive a little buzzed. And then that's, that's when all this happens. I would it figure. Is. Yeah. All right. So let's step aside. When we come back, I uh, want to know what law protects us if a drunk driver hits that, hits us. Can we get into that when we come yeah, back? Sure. All right. We're stepping aside. It's our first break of the evening. Uh, as we do so, a reminder, we'd love to have you join the conversation. 205-324-3600, 844-LAW TALK. Again, those attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live to speak with you. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching The Attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and off air. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, call, email, or text us. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorneys. Attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. When we started the show eight years ago, my hope was we would be able to do what we do best, which is to 
help people answer real world legal related issues they have in their life. People oftentimes are confronting various legal issues and problems in their lives that range across the gamut of legal practice areas. Bankruptcy, criminal law, family law, just to name a few. And to be able to have a 30 minute platform or format to where we can just cover various legal topics once a week uh, that's obviously the primary focus of the show. We love helping people. I think everyone at this firm feels the exact same way that, you know, the reason we do what we do is to help people. And, and this show gives us the biggest platform possible to help as many people as we can in the community. Welcome back into the attorneys talking about drunk driving uh, tonight. Would love to have you join our conversation. Don't forget attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live right now. If you have questions about this, a lot of questions uh, around this and surrounding this issue. So would love to have you take advantage of the opportunity to speak with those attorneys from Hollis Wright. Remember the numbers to know 844-LAW-TALK, 844-LAW-TALK. That's how you get in touch with Hollis Wright anytime, 24 hours a day. Uh, or you can uh, call, text 205 324 3600 if you are local here in the Birmingham area. Back here with Drew McNutt from Hollis Wright. Um, all right, so what law is it that protects us if a drunk driver hits us? So, like I said earlier, the claims against your drunk drivers are going to be your traditional claims, your, your negligence, wanton, reckless conduct that we talk about in just sort of any motor vehicle context. But in terms of the, the facilities that served and or furnished the alcohol to the drunk driver, it's 6570 and 6571, which are commonly referred to as the Dram Shop statutes in Alabama. And those statutes protect individuals who want to make a claim back against those facilities and bars and restaurants for the conduct of the drunk driver. And you can make a claim for your personal injuries or in some contexts, a support claim if a loved one who provided support to the family, like a head of household or something along those lines, gets injured or killed as a result of over-serving somebody. Um, and the claims are a little bit unique because in order to prevail, you have to prove that the alcohol was served basically contrary to the provisions of law. And so you have to, you have to establish that the bar, restaurant, um, or facility did something that was against the law or against the regulations that, that oversee them. Um, and the primary way you do that is when a bar or restaurant serves alcohol to an individual that was visibly intoxicated or from the totality of the circumstances that the bar knew or should have known was intoxicated to the point that if you continue to serve that individual once they hit that limit, that ultimately this is what happens. They're gonna get behind a wheel and they're gonna injure or kill somebody. I know you are not a restaurateur or a bar owner, at least not that I know of. No, I'm not. What your, uh, uh, the side, side hustles you got going on. <laughs> but, um, so uh, are, are bartenders and bars and restaurants is is there something that to where they they are supposed to train their people, especially the bartenders, to know what to look for? I, I, not only are they supposed to do it, I think they're required to do it. There okay. are certain classes that that bar, that the Alabama Bever or ABC board puts out that can train bartenders on what to look for it, for these types of circumstances. I right. mean, there are, there are whole classes and follow-up classes you can take about the signs of, of over and of over serving signs of intoxication um some bar, i've seen some bars and restaurants that'll put drink limits if somebody right. orders three or more drinks you have to get a manager involved before you serve them a fourth drink hmm. um, there are some restaurants that will have cutoffs that no matter what signs of intoxication you have if you have x number of drinks you're no longer going to be served there. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily know that that prevents you from making a claim against those because I don't think, you know, 
six drinks to me is different than six drinks to a 21 year old right. female that weighs 100 pounds. I yeah. mean, obviously everybody's different, but mm -hmm. yeah, there are things you can do as restaurants and bars. And a lot of the insurance companies for these restaurants and bars require that these classes be done routinely. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, another question we've got here, if the drunk driver who caused my accident was a teenager, can I still file a claim? Mm -hmm. You can, um, and in fact, it's, Serving alcohol to a teenager is illegal, obviously. Um, you have to be 21 in Alabama. Now, there are some protections. Sometimes the bar will come in and say, well, they, prevented, they presented an ID that said they were 21, 22, right. whatever. And so they can fall back on that defense. But ultimately, regardless of whether they're a teenager or an adult, if they're serving alcohol to any individual who is visibly intoxicated, then you have a viable claim. Um, also, with a teenager, for them to be drunk and impaired, the limit is a lot lower. Right. I mean, I think it's what, 0.04 versus 0.08, I think. Mm. Um, and so, for a teenager to be considered intoxicated in Alabama, the, the, there's a lot lower standard than for an adult. Uh, all right. So, but as, uh, so this does not make complete sense to me because if, if the business owner, if, if the minor goes to a bar and they have a fake ID, mm -hmm. Is the, so the business is still on the hook for selling uh, it, it alcohol to a minor? It depends on the fake ID, okay, and how okay. Good, basically how good the fake ID is. Really? And so it, the person that served them, um, <laughs> did the ID appear on its face you know, to be a valid ID? That gives the bar some protection. Right. But it still doesn't protect them, even if the individual, assuming was over 21, and they serve them to a point of excess intoxication. Right, yeah, that it, makes sense. It doesn't protect them from that standpoint. But in terms of just serving somebody and saying, well, then you get busted for serving a minor, they go, well, they presented a fake ID. As long as the fake ID was, you know, you know, reasonably appeared to be legitimate, I think it provides them for some protection from that standpoint. But it does not, it's not an end all be all in terms of being able to pursue them if that minor is overserved, then gets on the road yeah. and hurts somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a different. That, 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 well, that makes sense. Uh, question we've got here. I was told that as long as alcohol is not sold to someone um, that I could not be held responsible for an injury caused by someone who got drunk at my house and then got into a fight. Is that true? It, it depends. It, it, it's not just the sale. I believe the, the statute provides the sale, furnishing, or distribution of the alcohol. Um, generally, there are some, some protections if it's a home versus a business. Some of the same standards don't apply to homeowners that apply to businesses. Um, not to be a lawyer and answer the question of it depends, but ultimately it depends on the facts of that circumstance. Mm -hmm. All right, and those claims are usually pursued under the homeowner's coverage. The standards applicable to a homeowner are different than the standards that are applicable to a, uh, a business. It, it, it does seem as though I've heard kind of cases have made the news uh, whenever, you know, a, a parent, you know, the cool mom, cool mm -hmm. dad allowed the kids to drink and then something terrible happened and, and that adult was held responsible some i mean i know that's kind of been in the news it, it there's a big distinction in that context from the home you know furnishing of alcohol between furnishing it to minors and furnishing it to adults right i mean the, the if you furnish it to minors you can definitely be held responsible for what happens to that minor and or anybody that they injure when they leave your house yeah yeah mm. um because i i would think if if someone else's child you know, you let them sleep over somebody's house, you know, you're trusting that mm -hmm. adults gonna be there and adults gonna t make good decisions. And then if that, you find out that adult is, is not at all. Um, and, yeah. that, and that falls under a separate claim of basically the parents would then have a claim back against the other parents for, for, for furnishing alcohol to their minor right. and the consequences of it. Yeah, yeah, uh, tragic. Um, but you do hear those stories, so, so it's, it's kind of wild that that's ripped right from the headlines. All right, when we come back, can the driver of a vehicle sue the bar for their own intoxication? Which sounds like a crazy question, but uh, maybe you've gotten that one before. <laughs> we have. Um, all right, we'll jump into that one. We're stepping aside as we do so. A reminder, Hollis Wright does a fantastic job when it comes to social media. A great educational and informational resource there. So be sure and follow them. Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter. 
uh, YouTube everywhere. Hollis Wright is everywhere. Whatever your social media platform is, Hollis Wright is probably there. Just search the term Hollis Wright and you'll find it a great uh, resource for you there if you love keeping up with legal matters, especially legal matters that uh, may affect you, your family, and your livelihood. We are stepping aside our final break of the evening. Stay tuned. More of the attorneys coming right up. I'm attorney Tyler Vail with the law firm of Hollis Wright. Many people ask the same question, why should I hire a lawyer? While there may be some legal situations that do not require you to hire a lawyer, the clear majority of legal problems would certainly benefit from having competent counsel involved. To begin with, the law is complicated. Even experienced lawyers typically do not represent themselves in court. A solid case with clear liability can quickly unravel without the help of a trained attorney. Lawyers understand the rules of evidence and know how to properly lay a foundation to get critical evidence and testimony admitted into court. Lawyers are trained to recognize legal problems early on in a case and can help avoid pitfalls that unrepresented individuals may fall into. Lawyers can also increase the value of a case by getting experts involved to help prove additional damages that an unrepresented person may not realize they are entitled to. An experienced lawyer has probably worked on cases like yours and can give insight to negotiating a fair settlement based on recent jury verdicts and settlements that unrepresented individuals may not have access to. Another important reason to hire an attorney is because the person or business you sue will likely have legal representation themselves. Non-attorneys are generally at a disadvantage when squaring off against opposing counsel or doing business with another party that has legal counsel. The law is complicated and an attorney who is representing your adversary may try to take advantage of you. Our law firm offers free case consultations that allow you to meet with us for free during a face-to-face -face meeting, where we can discuss the type of case you have, the potential value of your case, and your likelihood of success. This initial meeting can help you decide whether you need to hire a lawyer. Please remember, your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching The Attorneys on WVTM 13. Welcome back in to the attorneys. Our final segment, just over six minutes remaining. If you want to take advantage of the attorneys who are standing by to speak with you, you got a few minutes to do so. 205-324-3600 or toll-free 844-LAW-TALK. Here with Drew McNutt, a few minutes remaining. Let's kind of do rapid fire yeah. on some of these, all right? So the question here, can the driver of a vehicle sue the bar for their own intoxication? Uh, the answer is no. Um, however, the caveat is, is that the statute provides that anybody that's injured in person, property, or means of support. Okay. And so if the driver, say a father goes out to the bar, gets, gets drunk, gets overserved, visibly intoxicated, leaves the bar, on the way home, single vehicle accident, is catastrophically injured, um, the family, if that father was providing the means of support, they can have their own individual claims for the overserving of their father. Okay, uh, another question here. Who can bring a claim on behalf of an injured minor or child who has given or sold alcohol? The parents or the sort of anybody standing in the shoes of the parent. So if traditional nuclear household, either one of the parents could bring the claim. If the child lives with a grandparent, they could bring the claim. Basically anybody who stands in the shoes of the parents. Okay. So the responsible party, mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, insurance always comes into place and like um, all the time uh, on this show. What types of insurance do bars and restaurants have? Is it uh, kind of unique to this? It's a requirement. There, there are, uh, on general liability is gonna fall under your CGL, um, commercial general liability policy. But if you serve and distribute alcohol, you have separate dram shop riders Okay. Um, state requires a minimum of 100,000. Um, however, the vast majority of the bars that we encounter have more coverage than that. And there are also 
carriers that can pull into your CGL policy to protect the, uh, the bar. Okay. So, so bars, restaurants are absolutely required to have Does, some kind doesn't, of interest. Doesn't mean they all have it, but generally every year to renew your license, you have to provide proof of uh, applicable coverage. So whenever you say it doesn't mean they all have it, you mean there are some folks that are well, skirting the law? We, we know, we obviously know that people are required to have car insurance to right. get their license or get their tag. They can turn around after they get it and cancel it or not pay their premiums and it'll lapse. Same thing can happen in this context, but generally speaking, they have to at least show proof of applicable insurance once a year when they renew their liquor license. I, if, if you're a business owner, I, I bet some of these claims get pretty expensive. They do. And if, if a business owner has to handle them on their own, yeah. that's, that's a bad decision to not have that insurance. It is. Yeah. All right, um, a, a question here. What role does the drunk driver's blood alcohol content play in the case? Um, in the vast majority of the cases we handle, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty critical component of what we do because that blood alcohol content is usually the base from where we start to extrapolate back in time. And so what you have to prove is that the, the individual who caused the accident, the drunk driver, was visibly intoxicated or was unable to hide the signs of visible intoxication when he or she was served alcohol by the restaurant or bar. And so if you take the blood alcohol level at the time of the incident, um, if it's drawn sometime in pretty close proximity to the collision, there are experts that can take height, weight, history, extrapolate back to give you a blood alcohol content at the time they were served. And based off that number, you then get testimony from the expert that the individual was showing, they would have been showing these signs of intoxication. Right. Um, and so that's how you prove that the bar served somebody that was visibly intoxicated or unable to hide the signs mm. of a visible intoxication. Kind of piece it together. Um, time for probably one more question here. But um, I was in a car accident with a driver who I am sure was drunk, but the police told me he refused to take a breath test. Can he still be charged? And do I still have a case if he is not? Um, it a lot of it's going to depend on what happened after that. Okay. Um, a lot of times people will not do a breathalyzer or a blood draw at the scene, but if that individual was injured and went to the hospital, they'll do blood work, and that blood work will, in the majority of times, show what that blood alcohol level is. Um, in terms of a claim against the driver, you don't have to have blood alcohol to prove that claim. You can have your own testimony, the testimony of the officer, um, the testimony of any witnesses at the scene that the person smelled of alcohol, that the person was showing signs of intoxication. Um, refusal to take a breath test carries certain presumptions under the law. I mean, personally and criminally, that person's going to have some problems for refusing to do it. Um, but no, you don't have to have the BAC to pursue a claim against that individual. Okay. Uh, before the final thought, just real quick, you guys have just seen some awful stuff. Investigating these cases, mm -hmm. you just have these heartbreaking stories. What do you say to folks, <clears throat> or would you give them a warning if, if folks are in the practice of driving a little buzzed and, and that sort of thing, what do you say to those folks? I, I, I think it's the same thing you hear all the time is that the, the risk is not worth it. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody thinks it's not gonna happen to me, it's not gonna happen to my family, but if it does, it can be catastrophic to right. you personally. Yeah. I mean, not only are you facing significant civil liabilities, but criminal prosecution of drunk drivers um, for murder, vehicular homicide have yeah. gone through the roof probably in the last 10 years. And I mean, people actually, unlike, you know, 1950s, 60s, 70s, people go to jail for a long time for this now. Right. Yeah. Real quick, 10 seconds, final thought. Um, final thought is if you think you have a viable dram shop claim against a restaurant or bar, it's important to contact a lawyer. The evidence that you need to pursue these claims, it doesn't last forever. Right. Blood alcohol, um, video, receipts, all of those things are critical to prove these cases and you get, need to get it preserved pretty quickly. So get in touch. 844-LAW-TALK is how you get in touch with Thomas Wright. Drew, thank you much, sir. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you as well. We really do appreciate it. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright. 